Very Good Entertainment is brought to you by Good Vibrations, promoting an open attitude toward sexual health and pleasure since 1977. If you would like to support Beery Good Entertainment, please click on one of our affiliate links at lolalaracy.com or sorcererzero.com forward slash podcast. Hi, and welcome to the best of 2018 episode. From all of us here at Beery Good Entertainment, we wish you a very happy new year. We hope you enjoyed listening to some of the best moments from the past year. We covered craft beer, British entertainment, had an amazing tour of the Irish craft beer scene on Paddy's Day with two very special guests, celebrated Pride Week where we discussed polyamory with our good friend Tarek Rorstrom, we interviewed the graphic novel writer Elaine Jackson and Marvel Comics artist Dan Schaefer about their project Minding Mama. We experienced some wonderful Oregon craft beers at our outing to September Fest 2018 here in Corvallis and finished the year covering our local elections by interviewing three of the most interesting candidates. So why not grab a beverage of choice, sit back, and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Beery Good Entertainment. This is episode 41. Believe it or not, we're, we are now, we have leaped ahead and we are in 2018. I'm Sorcerer Sarah. With me is my good friend, Lola. Hi, Lola. It's been so... It's been like, what, three or four months? Yeah, it's been so long. And, and uh, man, it's it's torture not being able to talk to you like this for that long. It's been very rough and very upsetting. I depend on my friends and I miss my friends when I can't talk to them. It's been very hard. And I know we, you know, I know we continue to drink beer in the time that, you know, oh, it's yeah. not like we stop drinking beer. Oh gosh. No. Then we don't get to talk about it. I know. And I don't get to tell you cool stories that, that relate to the beer I'm drinking. So let's jump like right into the deep end because okay. I know everybody everybody wants to know what beers we're drinking right now. Mm-hmm. You you go first. Well I just realized that I actually have a connection to the name of this beer. I've never had this beer before. But I just looked at it and is realized that, is it uh, that haughty is it that haughty lobster one? No. But that Sorry. sounds cool. What's that? I can't remember what the name of it is. It's just there's this really gorgeous woman on the bottle. It's neat. Okay, well, I haven't heard that. I'll look for that. This is Duclaw. The devil made me do it. <gasps> oh, oh, it's a bourbon barrel. And it's a sour. It's a sour. So, you know, I'm, I've been drinking wine, so it'll kind of go hand in hand. I got sour. I got wine. So now I've actually sincerely said this phrase before. Absolutely 100% truthfully said this phrase before. Do you want to guess what I was doing? What was happening? Uh, you were trying to take over the company? Nope. <laughs> what, what was it? What could you possibly do that the devil would make you do? You're getting out of a, a, a traffic ticket or something. Nope. Okay, what is it? When I was eight years old, I was jumping on my mother's bed, which I was not supposed <sighs> to do. Mm-hmm. Have you have I told this story before? No, no. But okay. you know, kids jumping on beds—that's pretty that's normal. What they do? Yep. Well, this particular case, I jumped, and I went over away from the bed, and I landed on the TV antenna. <gasps> yep. Oh, the TV. No. Yeah. <clears throat> the TV antenna went into my butt cheek. Went into the butt cheek. Right. Gash. <laughs> Okay. I I was screaming and my parents were upset. My mother was screaming and crying and they had me like over the bed, you know, face down because, you know, my gash was upright. And I guess they're trying to get the um, antenna out my butt. And, and I was so upset. I was crying and I was saying, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made oh me do God. it. Which, re- 
which really wasn't true. I did it on my own, but that's all I knew to say. That was the only way I could think to get out of it. I was just saying, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. So I could not sit down. They took me to the hospital and I had to stand. I guess I went by stretcher because I was not allowed to stand. I had to stand in the emergency room until they could do surgery on me. Oh, oh yeah. you were what, you said you were eight? I was eight. Oh, that is so sad. I, know, I so have to sad. say it's 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 a little funny. <laughs> it is funny. I can laugh at it now. I mean, how many people can say they landed on an antenna and it went into their butt cheek? Festerus is is um it's about as dark as I usually like for a winter ale. Okay. It's kind of like a darkish amber brown. It does not pour with a huge head, but it leaves some lacing on the glass. Okay. And it definitely smells like Hop Valley. This is a Northwest take on an English style old ale. Oh, cool. Okay. It doesn't say what hops it uses. I'm I'm not I'm not in love with Hop Valley's website. Oh, okay. It doesn't I mean it gives you the ABV and it gives you the IBUs. This is six point eight percent with sixty okay. IBUs. But it doesn't okay. tell you, you know, like the little intricate stuff we like which hops they that. used or which malts they used. The beer nerd stuff. We mm -hmm. want to know that. Cause I personally want to know that because I will either like or dislike an IPA based on what kind of hops they use. Yeah. There are certain and hops that I just don't like as much as other hops. I love old ales. And this is definitely a nice, hoppy old ale. Okay. You know, the, um, the way it has like a little just hints of nutmeg cinnamon oh nice I'm, I'm sharing with with the producer you have to you have to tithe he needs his 50 percent hey even churches only take 10 percent yeah but churches don't produce videos as good as uh as good as Corelsis does that is quite true that is quite true I mean, if you're talking about figs, like a real, like dessert type winter beer, Block mm. 15's figgy pudding is just like cake in a glass. Just I do love some figgy stuff. <laughs> I do. I, love I wish. I wish the whole world could get together to try Block 15's figgy pudding. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. I've never had it. I would. We just we we'll just all hold hands. Throughout the entire, you know, throughout the entire Corvallis and sing Kumbaya and drink boogie pudding. I know. I'll tell you what. If if you could get some figgy pudding, then we could do like the USS Callister episode of Black Mirror. And you can make DNA copies of all of us and make DNA copies of the beer. And we'll just drink beer forever. Oh, yes. So the mm -hmm. only thing with that, we can't drink just figgy pudding. Well, here, we need a replicator. We just, we need replicators. We desperately need a replicator. We need Make replicators. So. No synthahol. None of that no, synthahol. Screw that. No. We, None of that we're synthahol crap. We're more like the Vulcans and the Romulans. That's right. Romulans. Romulans and uh, Klingons. See, Klingon bloodlines. That's right. Yeah, if you weren't drunk, you weren't doing it right. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now here's something. Here's something I'm not sure I agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts Brewery mm -hmm. is collaborating with Dunkin' Donuts on oh, a winter solstice coffee beer. Now I love coffee beers, and Lagunitas. Yeah, I do too. Lagunitas Cappuccino Stout is my current nice. heartfelt favorite. Nice. But. Um, this whole, uh, you know, uh, collaboration with major mm. coffee producers. Yeah. I, I don't want a Starbucks beer. I don't want a Dunkin' yeah. Donuts beer. I, if I'm going to have coffee, for goodness sake, you know, go down to Colombia. Right. Go to Africa. Go to these tiny little places and collaborate Where with we need the them. Money. Yeah. yeah. Collaborate with fair trade coffee mm. producers. You know. Where you meet the people who are doing the coffee. Yeah. You meet the people who are out in the fields gathering it. 
That would be a good idea. Yeah. Chase says he's Irish, so obviously he was at high risk of spreading the love of beer yeah. and whiskey. I caught it. I caught it from Che from 3,000 miles away. Yes, the love of craft beer spread, you know, quite quickly once he got here. And I started eating more potatoes. The second yeah. I met Irish, uh, the second I met Che, I was eating potatoes left and right. Mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes. Does, does a girl... Does the girl come with potatoes? <laughs> yes, I, that was a very good Irish accent. And yes, I have potatoes. I have several potatoes. It's it, it, it. Ivan's asking if it is healthy. It is healthy as long as you pair the potatoes with a good accompaniment like Bisto gravy. I have never heard of Bisto gravy. I do not know what really? that is. It's mm -hmm. instant gravy. Not even joking, mm. instant gravy. All you do is you take you take a spoonful out of this little pack and you add some hot water mm. and it's gravy. Wow. Is this the same stuff they send to the International Space Station? I don't know. Sounds like something that they would go like an ask like astronaut food. Two of the things that I have people from um, Ireland send me are Bisto gravy and OXO mm -hmm. uh, bullion cubes. Oxycodone? Oxy, uh, Oxo, OXO, uh, bullion cubes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oxycodone. Jeez, I wish. I know. <laughs> I'd be like, wow, okay. Then we should let Glass, more of them in. Glass of beer and Oxy, I'm done for the night. Well, hi, guys. Welcome to Beery Good Entertainment, episode 42. We have some lovely special guests from Ireland. Hi, Hello. Adrian, and hi, Dee. How you doing? It's a great pleasure to be joining you. <laughs> I don't remember hiring the leprechaun. Did we? Did we? Did we pay for the leprechaun? <laughs> um, no, that's that's a bonus. It depends, you know. I mean, I can I can do different. I can do. Uh, uh, Sort of a, a upper class, if you want, or I can I can be I can be Dublin, I can be Kerry, I can I can be Leprechaun. <laughs> well, speak for county you're representing a beer from. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd actually be cool. Well, tell us a little bit about yourselves first, Adrian and Dee. Uh, let's see what you want to know. I mean, in, in like, okay, well. Um, I am a, a, an actor, a, a writer, and a comedian here at home, and also a beer enthusiast. We're also great whiskey drinkers, it has to be said, and we wouldn't say no to a bottle of wine either. But we've gone, you know, we've, we've dipped our toe in the water with, uh, with a lot of different whiskeys uh, lately. We like an Irish whiskey. We like a scotch as well. Um, but when it when it comes to beers, we're very much uh, kind of exploratory. We're always trying out new things. Oh, wonderful! How about how about uh, mixing your your whiskey and your beer? Do you like do you like the uh, the the barrel aged whiskey beers? Um, I've tried them, but not very often. That's quite exotic. I mean, like right from the outset, I have to say that the variety that you have over there in terms of beer we really don't have that much here because the craft brewing is is kind of new it's only in the last uh 20 years or so that it's really taken off so i i've i've tasted uh, a couple of you know um like whiskies that were aged in bourbon barrels and stuff like that but very rarely they're you, you only see them popping up every now and again they're sort of few and far between <laughs> Do you have like a do you do you have like a range of like alcohol that you would expect from your from your local beers? To, I mean, we have everything going from you know the teeny tiny three percent all the way up to oh my god, if you drink this, you're probably going to poison yourself. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it's probably I would think of a kind of a session. Or um, an easy drink as being around a four point five percent, and then uh, from something like a, a a real special one seasonal drink or something like that, 
or maybe one of the stronger kind of Belgian ones, I'd expect maybe an 8%. I've seen up to 12 or 13%, but, you know, at 8 or 9% would be what I would consider to be very strong. Let's start in with the, with the beer, if you like. Do you, do you have yes, anything indeed. at hand? <laughs> Uh, we do. And, and like I was saying, we uh, actually decided to take a run at this um, last night and because, you know, it was Patrick's Day and, you know, what else are you going to do except sit around I mean, drinking a few beers? Who didn't, who didn't so take we, a run at drinking beer yesterday? <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're very proud of the job that we've done because we, we, went and we, we went fishing around for stuff near and far and managed to find some really good things. Now, I'll tell you briefly... Uh, well, what we looked at. Now, so I can just show. Okay, let's. Uh, this is the one we're gonna we're gonna take off with today. We love this, and we've had it before, and uh, it, it's really a kind of a local classic. It's uh, Kinsale Brewery. Uh, Blacks of Kinsale is what they're called. Twenty miles. There's the yes. Uh, Kinsale is a small town that's very well known, uh, tourist town that's big into sailing. It's just outside of Cork. <laughs> And um, this brewery does two really, really great, really popular beers. One of them is the Kinsale Pale Ale, which uh, you can get on tap in a few uh, bars and you can get it very, very widely in off licenses. This is probably their uh, second most popular, but it is uh, a, a better beer overall. It's, it's a black IPA and it's absolutely yeah. so Stunning, really, really nice. Wow. Now I know the, the bottle the bottle itself ha is um has red stripes and the the lettering is the lettering is, is pretty chaotic. I'm not sure what uh, what text that is. It's so, like a, an old school uh, press. block printing letter yeah. press type of uh, like a wanted poster with the letters all mixed up. Is that a crow um, in the corner? That's it's got like yes, got a, it's got, got like paint splatter, there. paint splatter, and a nice little uh, iconic crow in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the on the side it says uh, Black's Brewery escapes the mundane of the mass market, producing beers with passion, personality, and lots of hops. This beer ambushes your senses. It looks dark and heavy, but tastes light and hoppy, and I can vouch for that. Complex fruity flavors mixed with roasty bitter chocolate and coffee tones. Living the Very dream excellent. since 2013. Hmm. It's not actually, I thought they were around longer than that. Maybe they just started brewing this one in, in 2013, but it's great. It's 5%. Um, and yeah. So do you, how much, how much hops are you getting off that, that beer? Is it? It's not hugely hoppy. It's like, as in, you know, you can get ones that are like a real bang, like, you know. Yeah. And I'd say the type of hops they use, you know, the way there's some hops that are really strong flavored, but this one is, is the way I like it anyway. Nice balance of hops, you know. So yeah. if, you, if you guys closed your eyes, would you think IPA or would you think something darker? I would think something darker. It's very malty. It doesn't... Mm. Um, you know, a, a, an IPA can be a very strong flavor, but I think the the fact that it's a, a black IPA, whatever they've done to it, I'm not even 100% sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's very malty and it is, it's definitely lighter than, than you would expect. Um, yeah, it's got a, it's got more of a, of an ale kind of a flavor to it. Oh, wow. How about the, how about the texture? I mean, it's, an IPA should be, you know, like really kind of a, a lightish kind of texture to it. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's I'm not sure whether, whether adding, you know, whatever dark malts they added to it changed that. Well, we were drinking a lot of IPAs last night <laughs> and I think it's no, really, we had like six different ones and they were all IPAs. And this is a very different to any of those. I think like, I think of, of IPAs as being, uh, I, I expect the flavor to, to really hit you, you know? So this, mm -hmm. is, this is quite soft. It's quite fizzy, but then I would expect that. Um, there, is, there is quite a lot of gas in it, um, but that's okay. That's not a surprise. Um, I, do like the, I do like seeing the, the, the foam is, is sticking a bit to the glass. That's very nice. 
I like yep. I like to see yep. that in an IPA. Well, I believe yeah. if if I if I marked my bottle right, um, this is this is from McMenamin's. Uh, yeah, I oh. mean this is just one of their standard uh, half half growlers. I believe wow. <laughs> this is going to be their Foggy Dew Irish Lager. Let's see if I yep I picked the right one. This is probably one of the better lagers that uh, McMenamin's has has produced for me, um, and I know I know Ireland, you know, is is pretty known for uh, for the, the cheaper the cheaper type of lagers, but this yes, this to me has it has um, like a a lot more carbonation than I'm used to from um, from mass produced lagers. It also has a, a lovely aroma to it. Like uh, it reminds me a little of a, a German lager, but mm. a little bit sharper. Do you know what it is about it that's supposed to make it an Irish lager as opposed to? Uh, well, they say we brewed this light, crisp, malty lager, especially for the St. Paddy's Day holiday. Uh, the maltiness actually gives me the hint um, because it is actually not very crisp. It's a bit softer than a, like a really crisp lager. And, and I, I would say the maltiness is, is what makes it more Irish than, yes. uh, than actually a, a traditional lager found here. Your local, your local breweries. The the most well known and one of the oldest craft brewer, breweries in in the country is Franciscan Well. They made probably the only craft beer in Cork for a really long time before anywhere else sprang up. Uh, and even the places outside of Cork, you couldn't you couldn't get them very easily here. So that was it was the go-to place and they have some classic beers they've got some really really good ones they did do a deal uh, a couple of years back where they got bought out um so now they're not technically independent and some of their brews have actually suffered a bit because of that but if you if you go to the franciscan well pub the original place you can still get the the, the right flavor <laughs> from the small batch they're still brewing it on mm -hmm. site yeah Whereas most of them are now brewed off-site somewhere else because they're all being canned and, and sent off to the international too market. Popular. They got too popular, yeah. <laughs> do you know but who, there's still some you great know who bought them? I heard it was Coors, but I don't know if that's true. I think that might be true, yeah. It might have been Coors, yeah. I mean, they're still making them. Yeah. Um, because they were award-winning at the time, but the brand is now what they're selling. They're not really selling the same beer. Last, if you taste it now, it's not the same stuff at all. You have to just go back to the source uh, if you want to taste the original beer. Yeah, uh, it's a different. But they do have some great ones. They and uh, and you can get them uh, all over town. In general, there's very few places that you can go that you can just walk in and taste it. A lot of them don't have an actual... Blacks have tastings. But... Oh, do they? Oh, yeah. But, yeah. you know, you have to book a kind of a tour to go and do a tasting down in their brewery. Apparently, we haven't tried it yet. Mm. Um, I don't know, about 8 Degrees. I don't think so. 8 they Degrees might have are another right? brewery about 30 miles away, and they're, they're like, incredibly popular. And I'm they've sure got one. Will I get one? Yeah, yeah. There's... um. They do just a really nice red ale, but then they have a special edition ones they come out with now and again as well. And we want to try that one. Like, that one's smoking. Yeah, yeah. We haven't tried this yet, so it's all very exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Yeah. Here it is very, it's very usual to have a restaurant attached to a brewery. That's usually if you're going to open a brewery, you open a restaurant at the same time. Because if you don't, people just aren't going to show up. And it's the actual personability of the breweries here that make it so attractive. We want right. to go in and we want to see we want to see the brewers working. We want to see the equipment. Uh, we want to mm. be able to you know um, take a tour of the equipment with people who know what they're talking about. We especially want the bartenders yeah. to know all about the beer because 
we're going to question them very carefully. <laughs> oh, That's you used amazing. cucumber. <laughs> what kind of cucumber did you use? How many pounds? Mm. Did you hand mash it? <laughs> you know, all these yeah. crazy questions. That's how intense we get about our craft beer. These guys, the ones that we're just about to show you, they're amazing. Um, <gasps> brown. They're oh, brown ales. I love one brown ales. From, uh, one of them is Australian. The other one is Kiwi. Uh, Kiwi. And they came over and they set up shop in Mitchellstown, which is a town in North Cork. And the company is called, yes, that's uh, Dee's hometown. And the company is called Eight Degrees. You can see it. It looks like an eight ball uh, on the bottle, but actually, it's a reference to the the latitude that the you know where we are in the world. And a, a lot of their little um, they have these little puns about uh, in the names of their beers about about where they're from. So they've got a red ale that's called a sunburned Irish red. Oh, um, and, uh, mountains, the mountains next to uh, the brewery are called the Knock Meal Downs, but they have a Knock Me Down Porter. Yeah. <laughs> So they're yeah. funny guys. Clever, yeah. And, you know, you can see by the way it's written. And they were the, right. one of the first ones to really go out to kind of, I don't know, outside the city and start marketing their stuff to smaller pubs. Because I remember just being out to country one time and going, my God, they've got eight degrees here, you know? Mm. Which, like, it was, you know, if you went anywhere outside the city, a metropolis, you were never going to find um, a craft beer, you know? So... They were one of the first guys along with Francis Conwell that actually started getting out there, you know. And they're they're really good at producing uh, some fun new seasonal beers that have like a, a really banging flavor. They can be difficult to take, but they do things from all over the world and they throw, well, they do styles from all over the world and they throw all kinds of stuff into them. They had a mango and something or other one. Mm. That we went to try some. Oh, you weren't there, yeah, but um, so they 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 do experimental summer time yes. ones as well, you know, that are fruity or but just short ones of them, you know. Yeah, um, and their their main range has you know it's it's got a, a red, it's got a pale ale, it's got a lager, it's got a stout and and an IPA. They've got a quite a quite a pretty a pretty wide range. Um. And this is, uh, it's called Bandit, and it is a smoked brown ale. And this is the first time we've seen it, and we've never tried it before, so we're looking forward to it. Like I said, we like, really like I really like the, uh, it says a smoked brown ale. It looks like there's actually smoke coming off the letters. That's pretty cool. Yes. Yeah, they've got great, great marketing. All, all the bottles look really, really cool. Um, it's almost like they theme everything they do. Um, which is really cool. So um, we are told Eight Degrees is an award-winning Irish craft brewery. They've actually won tons of awards, national awards uh, for, you know, the, the best beer in various categories. Um, so uh, let's see. This says, a brown ale is one of our autumn favorites, but we couldn't resist adding smoked beech wood malt for some extra intrigue. This is a malt-driven beer packed with Two row Irish malt, rye, wheat, dark crystal, and chocolate malt for real depth and complexity of flavor. And it just might be a runaway success. It better be That's, nice after that. Yeah, does yeah, it, yeah. it sounds it's very it sounds very dark and smoky and looks um, like they put a lot into it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's, there's a lot of ingredients in there, for sure. So why don't we use your glass? So we can see it. Hold it up there to camera while we record. Is it dark? Is it smoky? <laughs> <laughs> well, it does. Oh, look, it looks like a good that, brown. It's developing it, a nice, you know, a nice head on it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it kind of you've got a great well. beer. Kind of I love the way you pour <laughs> beer. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, no, no. It is very no, no, dark no. in the, it looks very dark in the glass. I, I can't see through it. Can you see through it? It's a, yeah, a big little bit you can see through it, like a tiny hint of amber. Mm. You know what I mean? It's not as dark as a porter. Yeah, there's a it's definitely just, just a dark about, brown yeah. ale. But it's gorgeous. It's sweet without being saccharine sweet, you know? Oh, yeah. That's absolutely great. 
Wow. It's very sweet, actually. It reminds me, do you have, you have Rogue over there, don't you? We do. Like there was, um, there's it's Dead a, Guy yeah. Ale, and then, but they also had this one, it was Hazelnut Ale, and it's hazelnut, very like that. Yeah. Hazelnut. Right, hazelnut Brown, right. Hazelnut Brown Ale, that's pretty common to see around mm -hmm. here. Well, That's my amazing. next uh, my next one is is again from McMenamins, but it's um it's one that uh, it, Chase spent the entire night correcting the waiters and the waitresses on how to pronounce the name, <laughs> <laughs> because we've all been calling it Irie Stout. Apparently, it's Era. <laughs> oh yes, I can okay. imagine why he'd be yeah. correcting them then. <laughs> Good on you, Shane. It's just as well you had an Irish guy there and put him straight, you know? Well, you, you'd, you couldn't have like, that. You'd like which stout? The Irish stout? Era. It's era. Oh, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. <laughs> Irish Jamaican. That's a totally different kind of stout. It's like... <laughs> I take the Irish stout, man. <laughs> era export stout. <laughs> and I like a point of stout. This is a full-bodied <laughs> ale with a pronounced roast character. Various dark malts pro provide this frothy headed brew with a color as black as night. This beer was inspired by a future trip to Ireland and the Reckless Kelly song, Seven Nights in Era. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it, uses, uh, it uses Golding Hops, which is pretty usual for a, for a stout. And it's six percent ABV, but the IBUs are pretty low at fifteen. So I, I mean, I don't usually expect a whole lot of bitterness from this beer, but yeah, it is dark. It has a big, thick head on it, and the the roastiness comes right out at you. This is it's. You know, if you held a, a handful of the roasted grain in your hand and then you smelled the beer, you, you'd be smelling the same thing. It's got a, a good carbonation on it. It's, it's also got what I usually think of as, um, as like a tang, but that's, that's that back end of the roast coming along, along the edges of my tongue. It's not as thick as I usually think of I usually the stout. Know but the carbonation and the roastiness really make up for that. I'm not actually sure how, how thick a texture should be before you think of it as an, as an Irish stout. I mean, would you really expect a thickness from your stouts? I've seen, so thick. I don't know. I've seen stouts. It's I, only when it's on draft that you can really get it. That kind of lovely, yeah, and I, I I've definitely had Creamy head thing going on, you know. Uh, beers that were called a stout, but I was surprised at at how they were they were lacking that, you know, that thick texture. But you can mm -hmm. you you can buy uh, a thing that calls itself a stout, but doesn't have that. Uh, yeah. and I'm not a hundred percent sure what the difference is. Sometimes you get a, a a porter, and it's it looks pretty much and tastes pretty much. This the way a stout would, but just doesn't have that kind of heavy that weight and and and, and yeah. creaminess. I think it if it's if it doesn't have that, a purist might say that it's not a proper stout. But I'm not really sure. There you go. That's the yeah. test. That's what looking you... out looking out across all the big green fields with all the free little yeah. leprechauns running around. Wait, yeah, yeah. Just, wait. <laughs> We oh, yeah. have the green fields. Skellig Michael, you know, Luke Skywalker kind of hanging out all that. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, I would I would I would pay buckets to sit there and drink a beer. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We were only well, we we drove past it quite recently. We were down that part of the country and we were driving along the 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 ocean drive and we were able to look out and see the island yeah we stopped off at a at a, a chocolate shop but it wasn't open at the time otherwise we could have been sitting drinking a hot chocolate and looking at it oh man and i know I, they uh, uh they turn the they turn the puffins are are there really that many puffins on the on the island well when i was there when you'd be coming back down the steps you'd see them in under 
little scrubby bits of rock. They'd have yeah. this cave yeah. nest kind of in inside the whatever heathery type stuff that's growing there. But yeah, it was amazing to see. I'd never seen a puffin before, you know. So it was like they're gorgeous <laughs> the creatures. Like. There are a lot of other kinds of birds there. There's like yeah. huge, huge colonies of well, birds on those islands. The, the the pointy one is the iconic looking one. There's a load of gannets that live, like you know, the, the boat that brings you back in goes past that, and it's just birds that live there. You don't go yeah. to go on that island, but it's just a cacophony of screechy sounds when you go past the island. It's amazing. There's thousands of these birds, and it's practically white. They're poo on that side, but that's the that's facing out into the Atlantic, so you never see it unless a boat goes past. It looks just like a normal rock at the other side. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah. So a gannet is a what kind of a what do, what does a gannet look like? Is it big seagulls? They like big seagulls, yeah. Like big seagulls. And very oh, noisy. Okay. Noisier and bigger than a seagull. <laughs> so uh, are they are they uh, are they as irritating off the island? Do they leave the island and you know irritate oh, yeah, people? Or... Really, you like when we were on the actual the the kind of the famous island. That you'd see these things that, that they probably wore the gannets because they were ginormous looking seagulls like they were like oh my god you know it, i'd say if they were hungry they'd try and eat you you know that kind of way <laughs> and it would have uh... <laughs> maybe that's what happened to the monks of old yeah oh they got eaten by gannets <laughs> yeah yeah they seem peaceful enough the, uh, the seagulls are are um probably more dangerous around here really because they they hang around in the cities you don't you don't get these big giant albatross type things coming into the city, so that's okay, you know. Yeah. Last night we also had this. It's uh, Killarney Brewing Company. It's an IPA called Scarlet Pimpernel. It's a six percent. Uh, we had it before. Um, we enjoyed it a lot when we were trying it uh, last night. Um, we found it a very very hoppy. Um, but that's another option that's on the table, and then we have a. Uh, I'm sure that's oh yeah. that after that. We have a McGargle's uh, IPA. And this is one of the ones that I like because it looks. There's a picture it, of a guy on a bottle. It kind of looks like me, which is. It has you on the bottle. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> got it. The <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> We can make oh, yeah, that the these uh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> take that our uh, our photo of the week. <laughs> I'll see if I can set up a better one for you in a minute. But um, we love these guys. Uh, they're from where are they from? Kildare. Kildare. So they're from Kildare, which is uh, kind of three quarters of the way between Cork and Dublin. Everything that we're drinking now is from uh, around the country. Um, we had this thing called Kinnegar last night. That is from Donegal. Wait, wait, um, Scraggy also... Bay. Scraggy Bay is that actually a place? No, it's that's just the name. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you guys have yeah. some of the wildest names for places. Maybe not. <laughs> Scraggy Bay was the name of the beer. That was another IPA. Kinnegar yeah. is a very well-known brewery in it's terms a very of craft brews. smooth IPA. Farmhouse. Oh, oh farmhouse know. beers. Oh, very nice. But they're kind of high-end. They kind of can go and stay there, and they're really, really dedicated to doing nice beers kind of thing. They're not just mass-producing them, you know? Mm. Yeah. And... and we also had this last night. This is a uh, crowd called Galway Bay, and the uh, the beer is called Full Sail, which I think is a reference to the fact that it's one of their stronger ones. Uh, again, it's an IPA. It's a five point eight. It, it wouldn't wouldn't knock your head off, but it's uh, slightly stronger than average. And uh, Galway but Bay it has a light flavor and very drinkable. We said. Oh yes, this one was actually interesting because even though it's an IPA and it's quite strong alcohol wise it was actually uh not that strong a flavor it was very a very drinkable beer yeah it it's weird beer. we have we have a we have an entire company called full sale full sale brewing mm. this company called mcgargles that's kind of a funny name <laughs> was a 
Right. See, okay, I can never tell whether it's a funny name or whether I'm just finding the name funny because I'm an American. <laughs> ha. Ha. No, I think that's hilarious. McGargles is such a great name for a brewery. Uh -huh. It's fantastic. They uh, set up about, um, again, about 10 years ago. They launched in a really big way throughout the country. They obviously put a lot of money into it, and they came up with a range that's very broad, and uh, we're big fans of a couple of their uh, brews. It's interesting the way they market it. They, uh, each one of them has uh, a name that sort of signifies that it was invented by a particular member of the family. So oh, this wow. one is called Fran yeah, Francis's Big Bang and IPA. And uh, it's just a marketing ploy, but it's, it's a good one. <laughs> oh, yeah, and this one is called Granny Mary's Red Ale. So it's like the grandmother invented this beer somehow. Hey, I could, oh, there are some grannies out here who could tell you how to make beer. <laughs> <laughs> Another good thing about these guys is they, they have a little six pack of six different beers. So you get this lovely little taster pack. So that's a fantastic, fantastic idea. Yeah, that's yeah, I salmon. love. Yeah. I love mixed packs, and that's one of the reasons I like Sam Adams because I can go and actually get a mixed pack. I love it when I see that from from craft breweries. Yeah, it's a great they idea. They have enough yeah. of them to do it. Most places only have one or two. Yeah, these so. guys are the only <laughs> ones that I've seen doing that sampler style, which is really really cool. It's, it's great. So this is uh, this is a red ale, and uh, uh, it's quite clear. It is very red, but it's not as dark as the uh, as the brown. It's definitely it's not an that. amber. It's definitely not an amber, and I can see I can see through it. Yes, yeah, it's quite dark. It's got a caramelly kind of a look to it. I can actually see myself in the glass. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I love that. It's breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> I love to do that. It's great. It's quite tasty. I would say that after the last couple of ones that we've had, it's certainly not the, the strongest flavor because, you know, we had the, um, uh, the smoked brown already, and that was very strong. And uh, this is quite a light flavor. I have a feeling that all of these are kind of session beers uh, to a certain extent. Except for the bang IPA. Uh, ex except for the IPA, which is which seven. is quite strong. That's a 7% to the IPA. This one is a 4.4. So it's actually relatively, uh, relatively mild. Well, I did find, I did find um, a brewery in, in, Smeag, Smeago, is that the county? Uh, where did I put it? Sligo. Count, oh, Sligo, County Sligo. Oh. <laughs> county Sligo, yeah. Sligo, <laughs> see, American. <laughs> I, I can see how you would make that mistake. It's no problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, county Sligo actually had to go. Um, the White Hag, uh, brewery had to go looking for. A brewer because um although they wanted to start brewery the guys had no idea how to make beer so they actually went and hired a brewer and their brewer is is the type of brewer i would hire very adventurous and went right back to the roots of irish brewing obviously hops were not around when the original beers started being brewed so he started using heather in the beer wow. and that's yeah. turned out to be their their um their USP. prime that turned out to be their prime beer was wow. um, not only heather in place of hops but they also used heather as their yeast oh, source yes. their very first batch they just started throwing stuff in like crazy and then they extracted the yeast from the beer to use again in their other beers Wow, that, that's yeah, so that cool. to me is a really amazing brew. Yes. <laughs> what we really came here to talk about, uh, <laughs> besides 
besides beer and pie. besides touching on your your name change and and I don't know if you want to uh, tell us what you decided to change your name to. Did you? No, know I don't want to get so I oh, Okay. Oh, that's okay. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. So I'm still fighting those assholes. Yep. Have yep. you been doxxed before? No, Were you I've, avoided, I've avoided getting doxxed. So. Okay. Well, I'm always worried about that. Our second, our our second big, um, and it's it is controversial across the United States is polyamory. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I mean, here you don't. You here it is a don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. So what? T what? What is? Tell us. Give us a basic rundown. What is polyamory? Well, I mean, everybody has different relationship structures. It's, it's basically more than one person. You're having... Uh, well, I mean, I'm dating at least three people right now that officially have the girlfriend title. Okay. It's, you know, I give them... I release them on their own terms, on their own time and everything, and their own subjects. I don't try to make them you know, one person or any other bullshit. I just let them be who they are. And I don't really do all this stupid, you know, rules and everything. But that's, everyone has their own, you know, different agreements. But it's more than one love. I mean, I, I guess that's the best way to sum it up. More than, so are these, are these, can they be like, can they be like just, dating relationships or is this like serious relationships everyone's relationship varies i mean there's i don't have any partners that live with me right now mm -hmm. and most of them are distant so we just go out when we can it's not like you know it's not the white picket fence bullshit or the heteropatriarchy I mean, yeah, that's that is definitely the life i have lived one person with one person uh, that's that was the way I was raised, and I think that um, I think that most of my family would be horrified to learn that anybody else in the family would try to go out with somebody else at the time that they're dating a single person. Well, see, the, one of the things I like about a situation like yours, T, is you're being honest. Because you see so many people who say that they're monogamous, they're supposedly in a monogamous relationship. And then they and go they off and cheat on somebody. And do stuff on the side and bring and diseases into the house. It's, it's a mess. It is like, a mess. Polyamory is about communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I recently like lost, I was in a fourth relationship. Okay. Like her husband, though, decided since I was becoming too male for his oh. taste that is over so basically i lost the relationship with being trans because she he had this rule that he had to be the only penis okay so so you run into assholes like that but you know every group has its own stipulations and everything but you need communication to make it work do you do you think uh do you think being trans makes it more difficult are you are you seen are you seen in, in a lesser light because you are trans well not really no i mean <clears throat> it's just harder to go out and date with like other people that because i'm allowed to go see other people too because i'm still trying to find the you know, primary partner to actually that lives with me and shit, mm -hmm. and that makes it harder when you're out on the dating apps and then you get all these cisgender people are there like ew. But it's like whatever, that's their damage. That seems. Well, that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lola. Go ahead. That's a, that's one of the things I was wondering about. I mean, you came from a world of you know lesbian and you know people who identified as lesbian. Do you find that? some of those people that you would have been interested in normally have shut themselves off to you because you're no longer a woman? I've never really been a woman. I just had to pass. Well, let me rephrase that. I'm sorry. Um, you will eventually not have the hardware 
of a woman. How's that sound? Is that better? <laughs> I mean, I haven't had top surgery yet, and I'm probably not going to get bottom surgery currently okay. because of all the shit you have to go through for that, yeah. and the healing process, and the rejection is no. But so I haven't really been rejected by any of the lesbians. Okay, that's I've what I was wondering. Like, like fawning all over me at the okay. club that one time Good. I went. As one girl okay. was grinding on my leg and almost fell off my pepper spray. So oh. that's that's not a euphemism, is it? No, that, that would have almost literally happened. I had to keep my pepper spray off my keychain after oh. that. Oh my she, yeah. <laughs> okay. that's, that's not what she bargained for. Like the one person I had went there with, like that, you know, invited me out, got jealous because because okay. all the lesbians because she's a lesbian and all the lesbians were coming after me instead of her awesome i love that that's really cool okay it would it would seem so well it's it's so it's so hard to wrap my mind around it because i've been steeped in you know the monogamous mm -hmm. for so long actually mm -hmm. attempting to care for more than one person at a time is it is it emotionally difficult i mean it, is it wearing to try to link with more than one person at a time well i mean i don't know i just approach each person i'm dating on their own terms i mean it's just and then we try to make time when we can i mean yeah we're all adults and we all have gerbs <laughs> yeah the, it's the difficult and then like you know one lives in Gainesville the other off in BFE and then the other one's out in Macon Georgia we make time when we can and it's just like okay I you know we message and we talk when we can it's I don't know it doesn't feel difficult for me but I've been poly since literally high school so, it's the normal for you. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure it makes a difference in that, you know, there's space for each one of your girlfriends because they live so far away. So it's not like you're trying to schedule, oh, I'm going to see Romy on Friday and Michelle on Saturday. Um, well, and like I have gone on dates, group okay. dates with them before too. Okay. Like we went, like I went with two of them to the Strawberry Festival. And I went with, you know, two of them to the Highland Games way back and, you know. That must be so cool being able to go out with both of them at the same time. Because, I mean, that, it, it must feel like a, a lovely uh, group, comfortable group, you know, you all get together and, and you have all those personalities together. You know, it's like this, this, this group, group hug date. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty fun. I think you're the man. I mean, like you are the man. <laughs> the man, man. I think it's pretty cool. It's like you got your entourage. Woo. Now, uh, <laughs> now uh, these guy groupies. Uh -huh. I like it. I think it's cool. Now, um, do your girlfriends tend to also be polyamorous, or do they just date you? They're all poly. So, do they have their own like girlfriends and boyfriends? Well, only one, like, currently, like, one of them is married. Okay. And the other two aren't really attached to anybody. Okay. So, but they, we all give each other a heads up, like, hey, I'm going to go play with so-and-so, or hey, I'm going to go do this. And that's fair. I mean, right. you used to... Hook up with this guy and fist his ass. I mean, whatever. Yeah, I mean, obviously, up to them. <laughs> But it's nice. It's nice that you have that communication. That I can see how the communication is absolutely key. I mean, that's just respect, you know. That's just respect, you know. Saying, "Hey, just letting you know, I'm going off with this person. I met this person." You know, it's just part of communicating. I would think. Yeah. And it's like we're not keeping secrets, and you know, the only rule they had for me is have fun. Don't get in trouble and 
you know, don't come home with any diseases. You know? Yeah, keep that's, it safe. That's always my worry. One of the reasons I said about, you know, the people who say they're monogamous, but they're really, you know, skunking around. I worry about, you know, you bring diseases into your household. Because I used to work with patients with HIV like 20 years ago. And I met a lot of women who they had no idea their husbands were cheating, or at least they didn't acknowledge it. And through no fault of their own, they have a, at that time, fatal disease. And so that's why it, it makes me cringe when I hear about someone like cheating on their girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever for that reason. But you have an open communication. And so I think that's a lot less likely to happen in your situation. I like I mean, that. Someone could lie at some point and that's on them. Hopefully they don't. Well, it's, you know, there, there are consequences for action. Somebody lies to you or, you know, then, you know, you got to accept that, uh, you got to accept the consequence of whether to, whether to be let go from the relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm not usually mm -hmm. that harsh. I mean, well, I mean, if there, it, it's, it would be one thing to admit to risky behavior. Hey, I, I really want to go out with this person, but you know, it's kind of a, a risk thing, you know, and it's a total other thing to not even tell them, tell your, your significant other, you're, you're going out with them. I mean, I think as long as everyone knows what's going on, knows, you know, the situation, I, it sounds like it works out pretty well. It actually sounds normal. It, it really does. It sounds, it's as long as the communication is happening, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't sound like the apocalyptic event that that I've been led to believe it is. I mean, it really depends on if everybody has to be on the same level and on the same page about things. You get some people that you know, have been in abusive poly relationships before, yeah. but that's because the person was a masochist and a sociopath. That's not good. So, but that's just a really bad combination. Because people can use the situation to abuse and then get their other partners that they abuse and, you know, gaslit and brainwashed to abuse you too. So it's not all fucking roses. You just yeah. have to work on it and see where things go and kick people to the curb when they ain't doing right. Have you ever come across people who are interested in you, but they didn't realize they had been abused in their previous relationship and it just. It really kind of showed with their own manipulative behavior. I'm usually quick to call out people on their shit nowadays. Yeah. Read them like, you know, left, right, up, and down. So I, you know, normally just had to steer clear of anybody that brings off too many red flags. Yeah. Just, like, nope, bye. You do and not that, that, bye. That shows good judgment. Not everyone's secure enough in themselves to make those kind of calls. I think a lot of people, you know, they may just think, oh, well, I'm here. This person is interested in me, so let's do it. They don't yeah. stop to think, how does this person affect me? I don't settle for bullshit. Hi, guys. You are returned to Very Good Entertainment. This is episode 44, and we're here with Elaine and Dan and we'll be talking about brand new uh, project called Minding Mama. Uh, Elaine, you're in the UK. Could yeah. you please tell us, could you please tell us basically, uh, basically what is your project about? Uh, Minding Mama is a comic book series uh, about a future earth where the ozone layer has been practically destroyed by decades of um, intense solar flare activity, um, which Barack Obama called space weather events. Um, and it's about Mama's um, fight to save herself and her son from um, possibly starvation and find other communities that have survived. And she sets out on a journey with her farm bot Cyril to find other communities. And of course, this is dangerous because of the UV problem. And uh, so that they'll get into all kinds of adventures and she'll discover things about her past that, you know, which uh, are rather troubling to her, which I can't go into now because it's spoilers, but that, that's basically it. 
<clears throat> well, that and and you're actually putting this uh, as I understand you're putting this on Patreon. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you also putting this on a crowdfunding site? On, on Kickstarter as well. Yeah. Yeah, and that starts on the 27th of August. Um, this is to enable us to um, produce the first issue, pay for all the artist fees and printing and postage and packaging, all that kind of stuff, and for the rewards for the lovely people who, who we hope were going to back us. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, tell us a little bit about about yourself, Elaine. Um. Well, I live here in the UK. I was born in a little town called Aldershot, which um, you may or may not know, probably not. Um, it was known as the home of the British Army. Um, my family weren't in the military, but um, we just happened to live there. Um, and I've been a science fiction fan since, probably since I first read, I was going to say The Magic Faraway Tree. I'm not sure that qualifies as science fiction, but definitely since Captain Scarlet. Um, oh, Star wow. Trek, UFO, and all that kind of thing. Blake Seven, Doctor Who. Uh, I just love the whole thing, and I love um, Hello. Uh, genres. Hello, Lola. Hello. Speculative fiction. Um, and I started writing uh, properly. I used to write fan fiction before, but um, uh, in 2011, 2012, I started to write my own original fiction. And I've been a self-published author or indie author ever since. Fantastic. Fantastic. And our my co-host Lola just joined us. Hi, Lola. How's it going? Pretty good so far. <laughs> so Dan, so I'm, Dan, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you uh, talk a little bit about yourself. You are the storyboard artist for this project, correct? Well, I'm actually the artist on the project, uh, as well as. Uh, originally, when uh, Elaine contacted me, it was to storyboard a potential animated film. Uh, but we had talked during that period about maybe doing it as a comic book first so that we could sort of um, gain some interest and um, develop the characters visually. So that's how this kind of got started. And then that led to doing a, um, a short uh, video piece to help promote the the kickstarter campaign that's coming out uh later this month so that way you could then we could sort of like do we sort of did everything but the animated film so far so um maybe that will happen next you know after the first issue comes out and get some interest you know but um the idea was really just to put everything on paper the more, the more time that we have to develop the way the characters look the better that's oh. fantastic. So, and, it, and I, I come from a film and comic book background. I started in comics. I, um, my first TV show was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles back in the '90s. Um, I worked for a lot of different ad agencies. I worked for Adidas and Nike, where the, here in in Oregon, Portland, um, and uh, I've worked on many films since then. Um, I worked on Lean on Pete that just came out a few you know several months ago uh that, to the theaters so uh so i'm involved in a lot of media fantastic you did that it sounds like you guys were were really well suited to really join up for this project did you when when elaine first described the project to you could you actually see it in your oh. head Absolutely, because as a storyboard artist, I'm typically given a script and pretty much before most of the crew, and I have to um, visualize it just to see what I what it is I could potentially be drawing. So it's very easy for me to essentially have seen a movie before it's come out, you know, because I've read the script and I can visualize what, well, I have to visualize what's happening. So uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's the plus of being a storyboard artist. Yeah. This is a special episode filmed live at September Fest 2018 in Corvallis, Oregon. We tried beers from nine different breweries and even a few homebrew efforts through Heart of the Valley Home Brewers. From dark to sour, we spent all day trying new unique beers native to our home state of Oregon. We even found a brewery we didn't know existed. 
Our special congratulations to Dirt Road Brewing for becoming Corvallis, Oregon's sixth craft brewery. Grab a glass and get your taste buds ready to hear all about our trip through September Fest 2018. Hi guys, it's Sorcerer Zero with Beery Good Entertainment, and we are back for another September Fest. September Fest is started, and I decided to start with a doozy: Klamath Basin Brewing's Chocolate Espresso Stout. Now this uses espresso beans from West Coast Coffee, and man, does this smell like coffee! There is real chocolate in this chocolate espresso stout, not just chocolate malt, and I'm a stickler for that one. Mm. It is lovely and thick. The coffee shines right through it, and it actually does stick to the sides of the glass. I think it could be just a hint thicker, but the bitterness from the coffee really goes very well with the chocolate. And this is something I'd really love to take home a six pack of. Wow, this is, this is a bit of an easy drinker chocolate espresso stout, but it is lovely. Well guys, we'll see you for the next one. Hi guys, it's Sorcerer Zero with Beery Good Entertainment. I've got an interview for you. I just tried Klamath Basin's Chocolate Espresso Stout and I'm here with the brewer, Corey. Hi Corey, how you doing? Hey, great, how are you? Pretty good. You know, I am I am actually really impressed with that Chocolate Espresso Stout. Um, the, whatever hops you oh, use oh, actually yeah. really yeah, made the down. chocolate yeah. and the espresso stand out. Uh-huh. Do you think that uh, do you think that stouts, especially like chocolate stouts, are going to become a bigger thing? Like we've seen hazy IPAs becoming right. You know, um, I mean, we've seen like mountainous, mountainous uh, stout and everything, yeah. and yours is just as just as good, if not better, than mountainous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? Thank you. Um, you know, uh, last year, last fall was the first time we did that beer, and it. Um, it, it did really well for us. People loved it. Um, we sold out of it very quickly, and uh, we brought it back again this fall. Um, it's looking like it's going to do the same. Um, just uh, in general, I do see a lot of people really enjoying some of these, um, you know, porters and stouts that have a little, little something extra, a little, little flavor. Um, our, actually, our number one selling year-round beer is a vanilla porter. Um, I've tried the vanilla porter. Yes. It's actually it's it's very rich and very sweet on the tongue with just that lovely bite I like. Mm -hmm. And you guys do, do you think do you think you'll do more dark no, beers no, as yeah, time yeah, goes on sure. or, or oh, is this kind of be your your kind of like your anchor stone or <laughs> You know, um, we, we uh, you know, I, well, I personally really enjoy experimenting with some dark beers and uh, so a little, uh, little sneak preview. Just yesterday we brewed a batch, a, um, it's a collaboration beer we did with Walkabout Brewing out of Medford. Um, we brewed this at our place yesterday. It's a Belgian stout that's going to go into red wine barrels. And that is going to be released at the Holiday <laughs> Ale Fest in Portland. At, uh, I believe that's yep. the end of November. Yeah. And do you have a name for it? Um, Big deal. Not yet. That's still a, sort of a work in progress. Okay. Cool. Belgian. I I yes. That's fantastic. That's well, guys, if you're into dark beers, uh, Klamath Basin is one you should be looking out for. Are you, are you actually bottling uh, nice. yes. the chocolate espresso stout? Uh, yes, yes, we do have uh, some of that in 22s. Cool. Fantastic, 22s of the chocolate espresso stout. This is Boggy Boone Hazelnut and Chocolate Stout at 6%. This is a dessert stout. I'm gonna go get myself a thing. And wow, this is just this is chocolate all over. This is this is definitely chocolate bar material. Mm. Very thick, very rich, very much chocolate all the way through the flavor. Mm. And again, whatever whatever hops are being used in here really emphasizes that lovely dark chocolate. I really think this is this is a successful dessert beer. 
although it could be just a touch sweeter for my personal taste, I think other people who really like beer as a dessert item are really going to enjoy this. Well, guys, Elkhorn Brewery. This is uh, this is new to us. I've never tried them, and I'm going to go look out for more of what they have to give us. Well, I finally, finally found a McMenamin's Brewer. Cody, oh my God, you have no idea how much I love that mug, mug, mug coffee brown. Oh, I'm glad you do. I wish I could have that every single morning for breakfast for the rest of my life. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about how you decided to do a brown instead of instead of like a instead of a porter or a stout? Sure. Yeah. So. Um... With my in, in my mind, uh, porters and stouts are usually more malt heavy, um, and I felt like the, the the brown would really push the, the coffee through. You really get that really nice coffee flavor in a brown. It's a little less malty, a little less uh, caramely, so I feel like the the brown was a really good choice for coffee. Yeah, the drinkability really reminded me of like a Yorkshire beer. Like yeah. I, I felt like I was sitting in it, you know, like sitting down, you know, just something that I could really sure. kind of drink down. It was yeah. great. Nice, easy drinking, but still has a really, yeah. still has a little bit of a multi character. Are you planning more browns or any more dark ales? Or are you going to go back to some more of the, some more of the other? Oh yeah, I, I, I love dark beers. I love multi beers. I am also a huge IPA fan. Uh, I love malty beers and hoppy beers, so I'm always I'm always trying to do something really light, something really in the middle ground, malty, and then something really dark. This is usually what what my uh, brewing style is. I have noticed in the past, I think about the past year, the land of IPAs has suddenly shifted. We're getting Belgians, we're getting hazy, we're getting sours, we're getting, like this year especially, we're getting stouts and porters and dark beers. Is this a trend that's going to continue, do you think? Or are we going to start seeing more darker here in the Northwest? I think here in the Northwest we love hops. We're, we grow hops here in the Northwest and uh, a lot of the brewers really love to showcase the fact that we grow a lot of really fresh and great hops here. Um, but I still think that there's a really great uh, direction for multi beers, especially the fall's coming around. So I feel like multi beers are going to start coming around a little more instead of yeah. IPAs or really uh, even like the, the new schooler IPAs, kind of lighter with a really, really huge hop aroma and flavor with, a lot, with not a lot of bittering hops. Uh, that's a really good summer style beer, but I feel like the multi beers are going to be coming around more for the fall. For now sure. I know I know McMenamin's cans beers. Sure. Are you guys extending that range? Um, so we're going to be canning a lot more beers for sure. Uh, we do all of our canning up at Edgefield. Um, they brew the batches that they brew up at Edgefield. They'll can. So that's the only batch that they'll can is up at Edgefield. So all the beers that come that are canned are brewed up at Edgefield. Um, so the brewer, if if the, the beers that, that you like here, those are all one-offs that I created and made. They're not McMenamin's beers. Oh. Um, so they're all my creations, the ones that you're trying here, uh, which is really cool for McMenamin's. We do uh, all the classic uh, uh, Hammerhead, Terminator, Ruby, and then we usually have a couple seasonal beers. We have, Right now we have a jam session, which is our or the Thunder Cone, which is our fresh hop beer. Um, and then we have a fresh hop, or a, a seasonal IPA at the moment too. So other than those beers, all McMenamin's brewers get to brew anything they want. So it's wow, really cool. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so we really have a very, very uh, nice creativity, and we all get to kind of do what we want to do, other than the beers that McMenamin's gets us as a Where did you Where did you start from? Did you start as a home brewer? Yep, I started as a home brewer. I've been brewing, home brewing for about five years. Uh, I've been brewing professionally for McMenamin's for about four years, but I've been with McMenamin's for about three years. I managed a uh, location down in Eugene. Before that, I worked uh, at the other location, Eugene, uh, East IT. And since the day I started working for McMenamin's, I wanted to be a brewer. Well, it's it's my, my dream, and I've achieved it. I well, you give you give us, as home brewers, you give us a lot of hope. Well, thank you. Yeah, keep doing it. If you, love, guys, if you uh, love doing what you're doing, keep doing it, and maybe you'll do what you love for a living someday. Oh.
Hi guys, it's Sorcerer Zero Three Good Entertainment, and I'm here with a brand new brewery from Corvallis Dirt Road. This is Chuck. Hi Chuck, how you doing? Hello. Well, I'm doing well. Having a great time today. Now, uh, I've never seen. When did you come to Corvallis and start brewing? Because I've, I've I haven't seen you, and I've been looking for new stuff. We started home brewing. Three years ago, and it just evolved. And this last year, we bought a bigger system, and we're home brewing out at the farm, out in, uh, out behind the fairgrounds on Oak Creek. Oh wow! And, uh, so yeah, we're a startup. We are officially the sixth brewery here in Corvallis, and uh, our beer has been well received. People love it. And, uh, we're a farm fresh brewery. We grow our own hops. We test, did a test batch this year with some uh, with some barley, which is a project in itself. But uh, yeah. We've had a great time just watching the scene evolve. Do you have a specific style you'd like to stick with, or are you just going to go for it all? We're kind of going for it all. My brewer, John Campbell, he's a, uh, a student of uh, fermentation science at LSU. He's an East Coast guy. So he brought all these East Coast styles, a lot of Belgian styles. So we're kind of all, all over the board trying to stay with the more traditional beers, but also come up with some very unique flavors and sours and things like that. Belgians, I mean, so many people are starting to do Belgians. Do you personally really like Belgian beers? Because we are in the land of IPAs. We're in the land of IPAs, and I'll tell you, people that when they start drinking our beers, we we changed their palates. They just love it. I've evolved personally because I was just, you know, a Northwest IPA guy. I just wanted an IPA. But now all these other flavors and just introducing other people of these flavors uh, and different beer styles has just been fantastic and watching people grow it. But we love it. So. Well, guys, Dirt Road Brewing, brand new here in Corvallis. Look for them up and coming. And uh, I hope I see more of you really, really okay. soon. Oh, thank you for coming by. Thank you. From Barsidious Brewing, here is Chocolate Casanova Stout at... I forgot the ABV. 8%. 8%. Wow, it's been a long day already. <laughs> um, now, take into account this this has been sitting around for quite a few minutes while we've been walking, and look at the head on this beautiful stout. It is still a uh, nice, lovely, big and thick along here, and the darkness of it I cannot see through the glass, which is perfect. And there's lots of chocolate, just what I love. Ooh, thick, so thick, so rich. It's it's like I. It's almost like I'm drinking hot chocolate beer without the heat. It's it's like a a cold chocolate bar beer. It's fabulous. This is definitely. I would give this as a present to my beloved husband, Shadeen. Because, man, this is spectacular. Just a little bit of bitterness on the back end. Uh, it, it literally feels like somebody took, like mashed up a bunch of chocolate, stuffed it in the glass, and brewed it right there. This is fantastic. I would definitely class this as a dessert beer. It's really thick, really rich. Five out of five on the on the untapped scale. I tell you what, I I cannot tell what hops went into this, but there's just a tiny little bit of tang right on the back end that goes really well with the chocolate and maybe a hint of coffee. This is really spectacular. Well, along with all that beer that you're going to drink, especially from all these recommendations we have here at September Fest, you're going to want something to eat. And here in Corvallis, one of our premier smoked pork places is Bernheimer Meat Company. I'd really love to just take a look at this. This is a, this is, this is a smoked pork sandwich. 
from Bernheimer, and man, is it tasty. It has a beautiful smoked, the smoked aroma from, from that wonderful, massive smoke machine he's got. And I am in awe of that big, huge barbecue. Lovely soft ciabatta bread, fresh greens, smoked pork with this this lovely tang to it. <clears throat> this is definitely you've got to try. If you're anywhere near Corvallis and you can call them up, you can look them up on the internet, Bernheimer Meat Company. It's totally worth your time. September Fest would not be complete without recognizing some of the most important people in our lives who actually inspire us to brew, and that's our home brewers. For an OSU collaboration, here is St. Pat. This is an Irish stout, a collaboration between OSU and, uh, and Heart of the Valley Home Brewers. It smells very malty. Mmm. It's very dark, very rich, and very robust, which actually leads me to believe that uh, somewhere somebody is making up some pretty good recipes for uh, for another dark beer. Mm. Great going, Heart of the Valley. And congratulations to Mr. Barry Cooper, Heart of the Valley Home Brewers. I'm about to try your wee heavy barrel aged beer. Wow, um, you know, I'm a pretty big, like, squee girly fan of, of, of Scotch beers. Woo. Oh, the aroma on this is lovely and sweet, exactly as a Scotch beer should be. Coming in at 8.9%, this is extremely thick, extremely rich, and totally redolent of those lovely heather flavors and aromas that we love to drink when we're drinking scotch beers. Oh, Mr. Cooper, you did this so well. This, I could actually believe I'm, I'm, I'm walking along a lovely piece of shoreline in Scotland, drinking this wonderful, very high ABV beer. This goes to show you, uh, if you're a home brewer, don't give up because eventually you're going to make something absolutely spectacular. Well guys, September Fest is almost over for us and as my finale of the day, I chose Flat Tail Brewing. I really love these guys. They were one of my introductions to the wonderful Corvallis world of craft beer. This is <laughs> Set, Set Hazers to Pun, which is a pale ale. I absolutely have no idea what ABV this is, but it smells absolutely amazing. It smells like pineapple and hops all together, and it's got this beautiful haziness to it, this lovely orange juice color. Mm. I think if you mushed, <laughs> if you mushed some hop cones in a pale ale and put them in there, this is what would come out, and they've done a fantastic job. I think I could drink just about uh, a whole keg of this stuff. It's very juicy, very hoppy, except the, the bitterness is, is only within a pale ale limit. It's just a little bit of pineapple, and it goes, at the, at the lovely, the lovely hopness goes all the way down across the roof of your mouth, down right through your throat into your stomach, and you feel kind of warm all over. It's, it's kind of like an internal hug, which is exactly how September Fest makes me feel. Well, thank you, Flattail, and thank you so much, September Fest. It has been a fantastic day, and I'm so happy to have been here with you. And I hope that you guys can maybe join us again next year.
have a great beer. <laughs> Hi guys, it's Sorcerer Zero from Very Good Entertainment, and we're just wrapping up our September Fest day. We're up here on the roof of Sky High Brewing, and you know, we've done some 20 odd videos today. I, I think it, at least 10 different companies, and so many different beers, I, I cannot even think of them all. And it was a wonderful variety of beers this year, and such a huge crowd. The one thing I think I won't forget anytime soon is the absolutely epic line I saw for Two Town Cider reaching into the distance. I think they must have had at least a hundred people waiting just to taste their cider. That is such a wonderful thing. And uh, to wrap it all up here at, uh, at Sky High, I've got another contender for my Oktoberfest. <laughs> Uh, go figure, because I love my Oktoberfest beers. And, whoo! What a lovely, grainy, malty aroma. Mmm. Oh, man, Sky High is a contender. I think I'm definitely, I, I am going to have to include Sky High in the, uh, in the challenge. Uh, Block 15 may not remain on top for very long with quality Marzins like this coming out. We'll have to see if I can uh, if I can keep up with uh, with the quality of food, with the quality of Oktoberfest and Marzin beers coming out here. I'd really love to thank my uh, my producer Che Dean who, Kareltis, who has been absolutely patient with me and has done so much with all the video production and the hours he puts in editing. Thank you so much. And guys, we're going to leave you with some spectacular photography of some of our wonderful, wonderful sunsets here in Corvallis. We really hope that you'll come and enjoy the September Fest uh, activities with us maybe next year. You guys, have a great night and have a great beer. Hello everyone, welcome to Beery Good Entertainment. This is episode 46. This is a politics and controversy episode in which we will be talking to a candidate for local office here in Corvallis, Oregon. We are holding a general election this year on November 6. We hope you enjoy getting to know something about the people who have a bit more of a direct influence on your daily life here in Corvallis. A reminder, this is a debate. This is not a debate. This is just a discussion. In this part of the episode, we will be talking to Riley Durain, candidate for mayor. Hi, Riley. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Oh, it's been uh, it's been pretty busy. I imagine it's been really busy for you, too. Um, yeah, working 31 hours and uh, moving and plus campaigning at the same time, it gets to be a little hairy in the schedule. I can imagine. Um, can you just, let's, let's just start out by, uh, just tell us a little bit about you yourself. Me, myself, like personally, or me, myself, politically, or? Well, you, yourself, personally, since we really want to get to know you as, as a person. Okay from Texas, Corpus Christi Act, to Oregon when I was 11, in Portland, where I attended high school at uh, Beaverton High. It's a pretty normal, somewhat normal life anyway. Um, let's see, I had a small dabble into the military, but um, I got injured and wasn't able to continue. From there, it just kind of hit the housing and job economy. Um, stumble that everybody else was in except for some of us got hit especially hard so i have spent probably the last decade struggling to get some foundation under myself again but um i mean coming to now it's uh starting to come to fruition i have a house that i'm going to be staying at and a job and running for mayor but um it, it is one of those points that I try to stress is that I am running for mayor because of 10 years of being crapped on basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> does it feel like, does it feel like your life is, you know, you're just grabbing life 
by the horns or is it kind of dragging you in this direction? Well, I mean, I, I, I feel like I have more to offer than just being an activist or a dishwasher or, I mean, any, any of the other things that I've really tackled in my life. I, I have a unique insight into problems that we have right now, and I feel um, giving back with that insight is probably the best use of my time. Let's go ahead and get get down to a little bit more of the 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 business like aspect of a uh, of the podcast. What exactly are you going to do if you're elected to mayor? What what's the mayor's job? Well, I mean, as as many people have stated, the mayor is basically a figurehead, but there's a little bit more to it. Um, I mean, for one, the mayor makes a lot of appointments to different boards around the city. Uh, that has a huge influence on the way the city operates and what priorities are had. Mm -hmm. um, as a facilitator in the meetings, um, it, it's it's sort of a a conversation starting position. It's uh, it's supposed to be filled by somebody who's well in tune with the community and is able to start really meaningful conversations that we as the community and of course the council can deliberate on. Did you did you have to have any special requirements to actually besides the signatures that you that you had to get? Did, was were there any other educational requirements or anything you had to prove? I, I potentially would have shot a little bit lower and gone for a counselor position first, but unfortunately, due to my housing situation, I had been jumping around a lot and didn't quite meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. So, being as the mayor position is at large. That's what I shot for. And it, it's kind of fitting because I, I am well known around town. I mean, how do, how do you think uh, of yourself um, as a problem solver? Do you, do you think you're, you're really good at problem solving, conflict resolution? You know, if, if you sat down with the counselors and you all started to butt heads, how would you solve a problem? I mean, I, I suppose it would very much depend on the situation. But, um, Solving a problem requires working together on solutions. So, I mean, finding the common ground is really the challenge. When you have an argument, there's usually a good reason on both sides. And being the person who can help identify that reason and bring back the cohesion is a, a very good thing to be. <laughs> So does it is it nerve wracking it at all? You know, thinking about being in in a in such a what most of us would consider a, an incredibly important position. Is that, does that make you nervous at all? It makes me hopeful. I mean, nervous, it's, a, it's like anything. When you start something that you're not familiar with, it's going to be a little bit stressful. You're going to have to learn the ropes, and that, that can be very difficult. But mm -hmm. the overall good that I think that I could achieve in that position is far outweighing that stress or, 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 you know, that factor of, oh my gosh, it's a big job, there's a lot to do. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of the time I'm doing that job anyway, talking with people and mingling yeah. with the community. So what do you think are our, our, our two biggest problems that you would like to jump into if you were, you know, to, you get elected, what would you like to tackle? What would I like to tackle? Uh, the big talk, uh, topics right now are housing and homelessness. I don't think anybody in Corvallis should be homeless unless they choose to be. And in the housing area, I mean, it, it's really two fronts. One, we can't just keep building townhomes out into the outskirts of town. Mm -hmm. And... Two, our rental prices are outrageous, and a lot of our standards are, well, so far. And we have a lot of restrictions getting people into housing, and as well as a lot of restrictions getting development of housing. So is, is housing something realistically that, that we can change within your term limits? I, is I there so. can, I can we can we you know can we really get some some people into some affordable housing within two four years? 
or, or is this just like a setup period and you're looking for the future? I think it should be viewed as both. Um, I do want options to start becoming available within like the third or fourth year. I'm hoping to get the ball rolling before then because it is such a critical issue. I mean, we just recently added thousands more students to our population during the winter months. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, on top of that, we have people who work and basically live in Corvallis, but don't actually reside in Corvallis. Mm -hmm. So every day when you watch all the people going across the bridge to Albany, mm -hmm. that's all of our dollars leaving Corvallis out to Albany. <laughs> Uh, um, how about RV? How about RV and tiny homes? Are you are you for that RV living and, and putting tiny yeah. homes on plots? I'm actually for looking at different or multiple different approaches. Tiny homes, of course, is a big push. I, I do want those in our area. Um, county just made it available, so I think we should follow suit. And um, we we need more different styles of dwelling, and just to figure out what works and then mm -hmm. stick with that, focus more attention on that. What style of living would, would you like to find yourself in ultimately? I, I, there are so many, I mean, different. I think beautiful tiny homes. Like, honestly, you don't need that much space. If it's an intelligent layout, you really don't. Mm -hmm. I lived in a truck slide-in camper for a little while, and that was sort of like a very small studio apartment. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad. I think the the major backlash on it is the um, the expense to putting utilities to them, which implies building them, and of course what people think that it'll look like because they have this um, set opinion in their mind that it's going to look like a trailer park, but it doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. And I I know we're you know it, it, the 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 housing situation kind of leads into you know a, a discussion of the of the homeless population kind of naturally because of the the home I viewed over the years so many conflicts um, involving homeless citizens and I've traveled to over eight countries uh, in my life uh, businesses don't want to be interrupted. Uh, uh, the public is concerned with the health and safety that the camps that wind up popping up um, and hardly anybody seems to be able to empathize with homeless individuals, uh, you know, feelings or difficulties and challenges. Of course, all these are really valid concerns, but how do we give the homeless citizens a voice? How do we make them, uh, how do we make them citizens again of Corvallis instead of well, what some people term as invaders of Corvallis. Yeah, it is definitely a hard situation. There's um, homeless people in Corvallis who have been here for decades. So they actually have seniority over some of our actual house owning residents. Getting them representation, I guess there's limitations to, the, um, to what it takes to create a ward, or rather there's, there's um, uh, prerequisites and that's, uh, due to population size per area. Also, it's not up for redistricting for a while. But one thing that we can do is create a village for them with representation, basically their own uh, community for which to present themselves and to create their own stable foundation, such as I have. It's not as easy as everyone thinks. You can't just bootstrap yourself. It takes a special sort of willpower to get that through. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Sorry, it's a, it's a very difficult topic. <laughs> it is. It's it's enormously it's enormously large here in Corvallis. We've we've had lots of of conflicts in the past year, and it's pretty heartbreaking to see people who who need that help uh, really go wanting or, or being seen in a negative light by by other citizens of Corvallis. Um, of course, we need, of course, we also need work as well as housing. When we're talking about homelessness, it's not just one situation. It's not just people without a house. It's people without jobs, without livelihoods, without any means of getting that livelihood because of other housing, transportation, et cetera, issues. So compounding of issues, and we really need to find a way of addressing all of those 
in a way that makes sense instead of just throwing our money to the wind every year on a temporary solution. Mm -hmm. Transportation, I, I have to admit that uh, Corvallis has impressed me with the bus system, making it, uh, making it possible to just get on the bus to get around Corvallis is great. Do you, do you see this uh, potentially spreading in a, like a, a handshake system with, with maybe Albany, Philomath, Lebanon? I, I definitely would like to see such a system or at least, I mean, kind of pipe dream here, but a light rail would be nice between the cities. There's, there's many options that I feel should be examined closely, especially going into a much more populated future and a, a much more spread out population the way we've been seeing. I mean, our roads are getting jammed. We should not be having this much traffic. We haven't had this much traffic. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, there are a lot of people coming in from outside Corvallis and uh, all those people are encouraged to buy cars instead of using public transport. And uh, unfortunately, because their their money is going so much farther than a lot of ours, they are actually purchasing vehicles while here. That's that's a that seems to be a big problem, too. How about um, how we can afford to pay for a lot more programs? I mean, are the businesses and OSU actually pulling their financial weight? Well, I do know that OSU gives millions of dollars to the city every year, and the businesses themselves, of course, pay their taxes. And a, a lot of the the issue that we're having here is that we don't really have the demand for people coming into town unless they work or go to school. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the summer rolls around, we are dead town, complete ghost town here. I mean, you could walk down the middle of the street in the mm -hmm. late evening and not have to worry about a car because there's so few people. That's kind of a failure of a local economy. I mean, we have a lot of niche shops, things that are really targeted for a, a higher income than what is typical here. I mean, with a 27% um, impoverished rate in Corvallis, I could see the use for a boutique, but not necessarily five of them. We do have a lot of, of uh, beer places. We have a lot of food places. We do have a lot of service industry. But what else What else do we need to put in? What, how, how can we actually attract these jobs that, uh, that we need well, to put people to work? There's one thing. I mean, I know we're talking about, um, talking about getting people to use the public transportation more, but there is another problem as well, and that is that whether they do or don't, we do need more parking. And when we're talking about the downtown area where there's huge amounts of commerce, there is very subpar parking. And a lot of it has very confusing signage as well. So people just do not like going there. They don't like bringing their car there and they don't, those people technically tend to not take the bus in general. They mm -hmm. don't like taking the bus. So, <clears throat> I mean, we, we need more parking. We need parking structures, things that will allow people to participate in commerce in the area. Mm -hmm. And what other businesses, what other, I mean, I, I noticed, uh, you know, the old DNC building is abandoned and, and there are a couple of other abandoned buildings. What kind of businesses would you like to attract? That is a good question. I mean, um, some clothing shops that are like more average geared would be great. We, we're looking at low incomes and youth. This is not necessarily the, the Pearl District or something where you have hugely expensive stores. Um, and we do need a variety of stores. We have like, how many how many donut shops do we have in town now? We have a lot of donut shops, not uh, just a lot donut. Yeah, Benny's. Well, Nutcakes runs out of a gas station. I, I think there are two or three more. It seems to be the new hype. Um, it, it does. It does. But we have clusters like that throughout mm -hmm. our commerce district, and we really need to diversify. So it's not really just any one thing in particular. It's many different um, types of business that we need to invite in here. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our business space is consulting rather than goods-oriented. 
we could definitely look into it as a community. Like what, who we would like to bring in, who we should invite to the town. And, and in this part of the episode, we're going to be talking to Rachel Hoffman, candidate for council representative of Ward 3. Hi, Rachel. How you doing? I am great. It's good to talk to you. It is wonderful to see you here. Um, probably the first thing I want to ask you, this is pretty relevant to us, is... Uh, do you like beer, wine, adult beverages? <laughs> so I consider myself an equal opportunity drinker. I will drink anything from milk <laughs> to water, but I also work, have worked in the beer industry. I worked for Block 15 for five years. I worked for Willamette Valley Vineyards also for five years. So I tend to be a fruit girl, so I like my Pinot Grigios, I like my Moscatos, and I like um, Viognier's when it comes to the wine side. I'm not a Chardonnay person, I don't like the oak. So uh, when it comes to beers, I tend to, on the other side, like a darker beer. So a porter, a stout, um, I do like a Pilsner style sometimes on the lighter side. Um, and then when it comes to cocktails, I tend to be a Cosmo type lemon drop type girl. Not a big IPA fan, unless it's a little lighter on the hops, but that's not really what an IPA is all about. So, but I do like a sour beer too. I've had some good sour beers. So, um, so it may sound like kind of a wino, but I'm in the marketing and entertainment industry. <laughs> So I kind of know my way around alcohol was a bartender, essentially, you know, so um, worked for catering companies. So it was my job to be informed and know all about what I'm serving my customers. So a practical knowledge of your local area. You know, I, I really appreciate that. And, <laughs> and you know, um, I've been finding a lot less people uh, going all hophead here in Corvallis specifically and starting to go for those, the darker beers, the sours, the less, uh, the less hopped pails. Hop, I tend to find that hops takes away from the other t notes of the beer. So you, and that's just my personal opinion. I know somebody out there is screaming right now. Um, but I like to taste some of the other finer elements of beer. So I like to, the fruity notes, the spicy notes, the, um, you know, the dirt sometimes I, I like to kind of get all those elements of beer. And I sometimes find that hops tends to overwhelm that. So I'm a little more on the fine points of my beverages and the same with wine. I like the fruity notes, I like the citrus, I like the um, the floral notes, which is probably why I like Moscato so much, because that's really easy to drink. <laughs> so. It is. Sometimes a little too easy. <laughs> little too easy to drink. But you know, Moscato is also really great to cook with. So I'm, I'm yeah. not gonna knock I am not gonna knock a Moscato drinker. <laughs> I have actually used Moscato in a in a white cake. So if you ever use as your li as your liquid rather than use milk or cream, if you use a Moscato, it adds just that little bit of tang sugar, and then as the alcohol uh, steams off, essentially it permeates into the white cake, and um, it's highly tasty. So. Um, oh, no, so I'm kind of a food person. I've been in the industry, so kind of food and beverage is my thing. You know, I that it's kind of where I've started my life is is being event coordinator, and so it's my job to be able to tell my customers and advise my customers on good things to do and eat and drink. So I'm well, a hostess with the mostess. <laughs> Well, my shout out today is for Portland Brewings, McTarnahan's Amber Ale. I remember, oh, guys, lovely. That, uh, Amber Ale and ESBs, same thing. So I'm going to take a second to, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be really bad and poured in the same glass that I've had another beer in. But <laughs> Oh, my. And I love the nice clear color that Portland Brewing gets on um, gets on their beers. I'm not sure if they mm -hmm. filter or whether they just cold crash, but man, the nice, beautiful amber color and 
they say that this is complex and i think i really need to disagree with that because it's only cascade hops uh oh. only only dry hopping with cascade hops i'm not expecting a complex beer and i really don't think they should be advertising it that way but it it does taste rich it does taste nice and rich so portland brewing this is a great beer for a great discussion and as always, I'm going to feed the producer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, podcasters, feed your producers because your producers make your make your make your discussions even better when the discussion is over. <clears throat> so, with that, I'm I'm going to move right into it. Could you please tell me what do you see your potential job as a counselor? What are you going to be doing? So, a state counselor role is the policy arm of the city. While the mayor um, is the leadership and guides that body and breaks ties when necessary, the city council are the ones who actually make, break, and create policy. So it is a bigger job than the mayor's, but it also involves working with eight other people to establish and uh, create those policies. It also involves working with the city manager to implement those policies, also working with the city attorney you know, to make sure they're legal. As a policy body, creating those policies will be a task coming up in the next year, um, looking to design the 2040 plan for the city. Um, there's a lot of different aspects that the city council is responsible for. And they bring those concerns from each ward to the city as a whole and then design the policies, procedures, and uh, vision for the city. Excellent. Uh, is it is it going to be, do you think it's going to be difficult for you working with eight other people? I mean, there's there's got to be kind of a... A, a potential clash of, of heads there. You don't know who you're going to be working with. At this point, uh, there are a few people who are uncontested in their wars. And off the top of my head, I have to apologize. I don't remember who they all are. But um, so there will be some same people who are current uh, city councilors who are running unopposed. I believe Nancy Weiss is one of them. I believe Barb is one of them. Um, but there are also others who are running unopposed in their ward who are new as well. So um, so there will be some new people. There will be some current people on there still. I would be new, obviously, since I'm uh, running. Uh, I call us 3-3. So there are three candidates for Ward 3, Passion for um, the City Council and for Ward 3 in general. There are actually three of us for the for the title, so to speak. Um, and so currently my job is the business manager for the Corvallis Odd Fellows. Based on your your knowledge of our council itself, how much time do you because I I know you're not gonna get paid. <laughs> how <Yes>. much time <laughs> do you how much time do you expect to be working on on council issues? So I truly want to focus on the city, my ward, and the council issues as a city councilor. I know that as a city councilor, there are some responsibilities for sitting on um, some advisory board committees, which are designated um, community members who sit on those advisory boards, and then a city council member is the, the liaison between the advisory boards and the council. So um, while I want to sit on a few advisory boards, I also want to basically do the job for my ward. So that is meeting with my constituents. Uh, I do have a plan that to do a dog walking, meet, your, meet with your counselor once a month, because I have a dog, and I know a lot of people in my ward have a dog. So I think that's a great way to kind of get out and be relaxed and meet with people is to have a once a month dog walking. We have beautiful Willamette Park and sports field um, for walking in, so that was my idea. Time-wise, 
I work part time for my nonprofit, the Corvallis Lab Fellows. So my other part time job will be to be a city council member. So um, at one point in my time, I worked seven part time jobs, seven days a week. So I think I will be able to do multiple tasks and be able to manage my time efficiently in order to do the job and uh, work with the people and work my other job as well. That's fantastic that you, you really do want to be accessible. I really, I appreciate that personally much because so. <laughs> I'm in your ward. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I, am, I am right on the edge of your ward, but I'm there. Um, <laughs> Now talking about uh, talking about parks and everything up, uh, let's talk about a little bit about the environment. I noticed that you are wisely reusing a sign that you that you happened to grab. Tell us about your views of the environmental issues here in Southtown. So I think it's a not just. A I mean, it's not a cliche at all. It may sound cliche to say it, but it's the, you know, act locally, think globally. As a community, you know, we have the the plastic bag ban in Fort Valley. I know for some people, they hate it, and it drives them crazy. But it is, I think it's just a small step in the long-term efforts that we can make as a community to affect our environment in the long term. We have to stop taking the selfish aspect of the here and now. I have two kids. At some point, I'm going to have grandkids. At some point, I'm going to have great grandkids. So we need to stop thinking about what is here and now and think forward to what we are going to leave for the next generations and the generations after that. In this episode, we are talking to Andrew Freeborg, candidate for City Council, Ward 9. Hi, Andrew, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? Oh, it's been a long week, but uh, but I enjoy the work. So it's long good. Long week and it's only Wednesday. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Wednesday. Um, let's start out by, uh, by just a, a little bit about you personally. Okay, like just kind of my bio, my history sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. Where are you from? And Well, I'm originally from uh, somewhere down south that we don't like to talk about up here. <laughs> but in my defense, I moved here about two weeks before my ninth birthday. Uh, I've lived here pretty much ever since with uh, the exception of a couple of months in Harrisburg and a couple of months in Philomath. I grew up here, went to high school here, uh, have a degree in uh, speech communication with a minor in political science from Western Oregon University. Um, and just got to the point, you know, I've worked here, lived here, and it's uh, time for me to give back to the community that's given me everything. Fantastic. And uh, I see you have a beer. <laughs> what, yes, I what do, you, do have. What are you drinking today? I am drinking the Mazama Brewing Belgian Style Blonde. Oh my goodness. I love Miss Hama's Belgians like no tomorrow. This is really good. I love it. It's uh, not too not too heavy, not too light. Uh, you know, you know you're drinking a beer, but you know, you're not gonna get the bitter beer face or have to chew it. And it's really good for like a middle of the day beer. It really is. Exactly. Exactly. It's a great three o'clock beer. I have Pyramids Thunderhead. Thunderhead IPA. This is a 6.7% IPA. And uh, yeah, I know recently I haven't been doing a lot of IPAs. I'm sorry, audience, but it is fall and I've been delving into the dark beers. But here you go for you IPA lovers. Beautiful, golden, dependable. I have had this one before, but uh, never on this show. Lots of carbonation, a nice, thick, fluffy whitehead. A little bit less hop aroma than I'd like, but a nice, thick texture and definitely hops that you can tell are right there, right there in the front of your palate. Another good middle of the day beer, especially for hop heads, bitter, bitter hop heads that, uh, that really do like the IPAs. And I'm going to take this opportunity to feed my producer. <laughs> 
without further ado, let's jump into a bit of the, the meat of the interview here. Andrew, um, I've noticed specifically on Facebook that you've been really active in the community. Uh -huh. What can you describe some of your activities for us? Oh, well, beyond the obvious of, you know, going to the city council meetings and the work sessions, you know, anytime I hear of an event in town, especially one that's being put on by the city that I think might be good for me to know about if I want to try and represent the people of Corvallis, if I have a chance to, I, I will go to. Like I saw you at the uh, bike and pedestrian one uh, down by the co-op uh, trying to deal with the new uh, bike path. And, um, you know, that's something that, yeah, I may only be representing officially Ward 9, but, you know, the interests of everybody in Corvallis are still my concern. So just trying to get to know everything I can about this community, about the people who live here, so I can represent them as best as I am able. Excellent. And uh, uh, can you tell me what what exactly is a, a work session? So a work session, um, there's actually something they just brought up a couple of years ago uh, before, and I actually just found out what it was like before at an informational session I went to yesterday. Uh, they used to have various little committees that had three counselors on them. And, but then those committees would come up with an idea and present it to the full council. So at any given time, two thirds of the council didn't really know what was going on. They just had to take the recommendation of this committee. Now a work session is a little less formal of a thing where all nine counselors are present, uh, city staff is present and they talk about, okay, here's kind of the issues we're looking at, try and get all the nitty gritty debate and discussion out of the way in a less formal setting before going to the formal setting of the council meeting where they vote on it. And is, is this something you'd, you'd like to continue uh, the work yes. sessions? You th yes, feel I they're think productive? It, yes, I definitely feel like they're productive and they allow the entire council to be involved in the discussion instead of said, having three counselors just get together and say, okay, here's what we want to do on this particular issue and then go to the full council and say, this is what the three of us think we should do. And then the other six go, um, Oh, okay, yeah, and they debate about it for a little bit during the meeting before making a decision. This way, a lot of the real nitty-gritty information gathering is uh, done in presence of the full council. That actually makes a lot of sense. Why did you choose to be a counselor and not another position such as mayor? Well, for one, um, I don't think that somebody who uh, has no prior experience being in municipal government would be a good fit for mayor uh, just because they don't necessarily know how how the system works. In Corvallis, the mayor actually has very little power, and that's by design. Uh, basically, the mayor's job is to just kind of set the agenda and chair the council, uh, which is if you haven't been in the council yet, is something that's mm -hmm. going to be really difficult to do. And so I'd rather focus on something a lot more local uh, as just my ward than trying to jump all the way straight to mayor. Uh, do, do you have any plans for any further political offices? At this moment, no. Uh, but obviously, things are always fluid. Um, you know, let's, let's focus on this and see if I can even get elected to this first before I even begin to think about anything else. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, do you, feel, do you have a good, strong feeling about your potential as a counselor? Yeah, I do. You know, having been going to the meetings and everything for over a year, uh, definitely got a feel for what the council deals with, how the meetings go, get a feel for what they face and how, how the whole system works, which means I think I'd be ready to uh, hit the ground running come January uh, when the new council is sworn in. I've read this uh, on, your, on your website, but um, I'm not quite sure I completely understand it. You have three R's, which is restraint, reason, and respect. Yes. Can you please explain those in, in a little more detail? So, you know, restraint is, you know, as we've discussed actually previously on Facebook, is about trying to help Corvallis live within its means and to prioritize its spending uh, to where we're taking care of the things that are vital and important first uh, before we start thinking about things that are nice. And the reason I used that word specifically was back in March when the council was deciding what to do with the new bond levy. I was the only one in attendance who urged restraint, who said, if we go to the $1.70 level from the $0.82 cents we're at now, it's likely to fail, and then we're really going to be in trouble. 
if we could go to either keeping it at the 82 cents or bring it up to the dollar seven to where it's replacing another bond levy that's set to expire so your tax rates don't actually go up you know it would be a lot easier of a sell to the people of corvallis on that night the council ignored me they did not do that they decided to go with the dollar 70. a couple weeks later city staff said what do we do if it doesn't pass and the council walked it back now to where it's going to be a dollar seven restraint which is what i urged reason is carefully consider all the options before making a decision i don't want to jump into something you know right off the bat just off of how it makes me feel instinctually um right there in the moment i want to take a step back look at it look at what the potential unintended consequences are and try to look at it from all angles as possible so that way we can make the best decision that one can make with the information at hand and then respect is what somebody once told me was called the platinum rule we've all heard of the golden rule treat others the way you would want to be treated the platinum rule is treat others the way they want to be treated so even though i know i am going to have disagreements with people and probably most of the time i'm going to have disagreements with several members of the council you know they're still trying to do what they think is best for this community and they still deserve to be treated with that level of respect and so that's what i do you know i came to riley's defense online when she was facing a bunch of personal attacks even though i don't agree with most of her politics i try to avoid going negative in my campaign because even my opponent is trying to do what he thinks is best so he deserves some respect for that and everybody who's willing to take the time to step up and try and serve their community deserves some respect for that excellent now in response to the restraint mm -hmm. uh is there something uh, Corvallis is spending too much money on right now? There's not really any one thing. Um, it's just more of kind of where our spending priorities are at. We're to the point where we are thinking about putting in a new taxing district to fund 911 services. We are to the point where we are wanting to increase fees on people's water services to pay for police and fire. And if we're to that point, if we're so broke that that's what we're having to do, we need to re-examine our priorities so that these vital services are not held hostage to bond levies, to taxing districts, to things where they could get voted down. So I want us to focus first on what is vital. These are the things like police, fire, roads, water, sewer, things like that, where if we don't have enough money for them and they don't happen, the city would literally fall apart. Then if there's money left over, which there is, then we can go on to the things that are important. These are the things that many people rely on to get about their day um, or to live their life, but that if there wasn't, if we weren't able to provide them, the city would still on the whole be able to function. These are things like the library, the senior center, public transportation, parks. These are things that are important and that should be funded if the money is there, which Again, there is. And then if there's money left over after that, then we can go on to things that are nice, which is really just about everything else that the city does. And if there isn't enough money, then and only then should those services that are in the nice category go to the voters and try to explain why they are so important that they need to be paid for with tax dollars but this way we don't have to worry every four or five years of if you don't pass this bond levy the library doesn't get money if you don't pass this bond levy we don't have enough money to give our police and fire departments everything they want and you know people of corvallis are just sick and tired of basically having those services held over their heads like a guillotine and being coerced into voting for these higher taxes so one question one one issue uh i've had even more than the homeless issue is the jail mm -hmm. do you do you think we need a new jail absolutely the one we have is too small it's too obsolete it needs to be done i voted uh to have a new jail because that's one of those things that i do still believe that is a legitimate function of government uh the one we have right now is just it's woefully inadequate it forces us to spend even more money to have 
to house inmates in other facilities across the state, including I found out recently at Norcor, which um, has a contract with ICE, and there are serious issues with that. So if we had a jail that was adequate here, we wouldn't have to worry about sending inmates all over the state. And where would you propose building the new one in in its current position or would you would you advocate for renovating that one slightly and building a, a larger one somewhere else that's where it gets tricky that's what i've noticed the biggest opposition is is everybody says well yes we need a new jail but they don't want it near me i would leave the decision of where to put it to the experts the people in the county the pe people in the sheriff's department they're the ones that know what is needed i mean yes having it downtown right next to the courthouse underneath there that would be great but i'm pretty sure the costs of renovating and expanding that would be just simply prohibitive um especially since it's primarily underground um so you know there unfortunately downtown isn't really a viable option um you know, I would try to keep it as close to downtown, just that way it's easy for them to get to and from their court hearings. Um, but as I, I would leave that up to the experts in the sheriff's department and uh, the county and whoever they hire. And as a city councilor, that would really not have any impact on us. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the do you think that the the homeless issue is part of the jail issue? To an extent, um, there are other issues that kind of are intertwined such as drug use um and the war on drugs uh every time that i see an article on like the jail's website about oh hey we had to release this violent person or whatever because we didn't have enough space i go right to the jail roster and i see how many people are in there only for a drug offense not nothing else and it's like well if we stopped prosecuting drug crimes then we'd have more space in the jail and we might not need to build as big a one and then there's also a serious amount of failure to appears, uh, people who get arrested for something minor and they don't go to their court date because, well, there's no space in the jail, there's no real consequence. We can talk about criminal justice reform and removing some of those misdemeanors off of the code, and so that way people who are homeless and are more likely to be subject to those aren't, and therefore they can stay out of the system and be more likely to be able to get their uh, lives back on track if they so desire. I'm gonna break away a little bit back to a, a, a previous question. Um, you state on your website that you're a libertarian. Yes. How involved exactly do you want to be with our government? Uh, maybe I should rephrase that. What types of issues do you not want to involve us in? Like involve the government in? Yeah, What what is like, uh, like for you is just not for our government to address? anything really in your private life anything in your home um uh, basically the the core tenant of libertarianism is what's called the non-aggression principle and we the best way we usually phrase it is don't hurt people don't take their stuff um so i believe that you have the right to do whatever the heck you want with your life your liberty your property your money your body anything that is yours that you want as long as you are not infringing on somebody else's right to do the same or hurting anybody. So the only, so, you know, if you want to have, if you want to use drugs, that's not my deal, but go ahead. You know, if you want to get stoned in your basement, that's nobody's business, but yours. If you want to, um, you know, marry three different people, that's nobody's business, but yours. You know, as long as you're not hurting anybody and everybody consents, it's none of the government's business. So eminent domain is definitely not a is oh, not I hate, a I hate eminent domain. I hate eminent domain. I consider it theft. Um, I understand where the legal things behind it and that it has constitutional basis. Um, but you know, if you don't want to sell your property, you should not be forced to. the The analogy I use is, let's say I come to your house and I like your car and I decide to take it. And I give you, you know, Kelly Blue Book value for it. I leave a bag full of cash on your on your doorstep. That's Blue Book value for your car. Did I steal it? Uh, to me, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> didn't, didn't ask if you, for it. If you didn't want it, if you did not want to give it to me, if I said, hey, Linda, can I buy your car? You said no. That night, I came back, took it, and gave you fair market value for it. It's still stealing. 
eminent domain to me is still stealing. And how about uh, things like cash bail, the, the cash I, system that we have in our in our justice system? I, I actually, when I went to Dan Rayfield's um, forum recently on public safety, that was one of the things that came up. And that's something that's been coming up a lot lately in libertarian circles. And I think definitely that is something that needs to be reformed because somebody should not be spending three years in prison for a minor offense before they even go to trial just because they can't afford, you know, $700 bail. Um, the, uh, I don't remember who it was. I think it was the Benton County District Attorney gave an example of, you know, the judge, you know, says, okay, somebody should be allowed to be out. Uh, I don't think that they're a, a danger to society. So I'm going to set the bail as low as I possibly can. And they only have to meet 10% of that. Well, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, even if 10% of the bail is only $75, you may not have $75 that you can just pop over to bail. And then you have to sit in prison. And then you miss work. And then you lose your job. And now you are in prison for a long time. You have a long employment gap. And it gets harder for you to be able to move on from something that was a really trivial offense in the first place. And conversely, you can have rich well-off people who commit heinous crimes. And so the judge thinks, I don't want you to be out, so I'm going to set the bail as high as I can. And because you have the resources, you're able to post bail, and you can go out and you can skip bail or you can commit another crime. I think uh, bail, parole, probation, that sort of stuff should be based not on monetary uh, resources, but more on character and the opinions of those that deal with quote unquote criminals every day and are able to better decide if somebody's a risk of reoffense while they wait for their trial. That actually sounds <laughs> it's really hard to poke holes in that logic. Where are you in in the removal of Corvallis as a sanctuary city? I absolutely oppose removing Corvallis as a sanctuary city. Um I also oppose Measure 105, removing Oregon as a sanctuary state, ignoring anybody's opinions on immigration in general or illegal immigration specifically. I look at it from not only a you know, basic human decency point of view, but a constitutional rights point of view. Um, the current law states that local communities cannot use resources uh, in cooperation with ICE for somebody whose only crime, and I use the word crime uh, is being in the country illegally. This would remove that, allowing sheriffs, state police, uh, local police to be able to do that. So how are you going to determine if somebody's only crime is being in the country illegally without massive, massive invasions of privacy and due process rights that are guaranteed by the fourth fifth and 14th amendment to all people in the united states not citizens the constitution is very clear where they mean citizens they say citizens where they mean people they say people and the fourth fifth and 14th amendments all say the rights of people inside this this country or inside these jurisdictions to have due process of law shall not be infringed. So I absolutely oppose removing our sanctuary city and sanctuary state status. Thank you very much for explaining that. that I'm I'm sure a lot of the a lot of the listeners who are concerned about that will be able to take your words to heart. Hi and welcome to our best of 2018 episode. From all of us here at Very Good Entertainment, we wish you a very happy new year. We hope you enjoy listening to some of the best uh, oh my God. <laughs> Let's try that again.